Hi there, this is Notable, and today we're taking a look at John Donne's relationship with God. We'll begin the video with an analysis of his 14th holy sonnet, Batter My Heart. And then we're going to zoom out a little and analyse the ways in which Donne's relationship with God is portrayed across a range of his religious poems. Finally, we'll take a look at a practice question and consider the best way to approach it. So, let's get started. Batter My Heart is one of Dunn's most famous holy sonnets. We mentioned a couple of videos ago that a Petrarchan sonnet is traditionally a poem of love and desire, and this poem expresses the ferocity of Dunn's desire for God. Like many of the sonnets, Dunn speaks directly to God in the poem. We say he apostrophises God. We can see this in the very first line, in which he speaks directly to his three-personed God. This word, three-personed, is an allusion to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. This doctrine teaches that, though there's only one God, there are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's what this word, three-personed, is referring to. In the first catrain, that's the first four lines, Dunn begs God to purify or mend him through force. Notice the many verbs here. In fact, not only here, but throughout the poem. They create an impression of energy, movement, force and violence, which we may not expect in a divine meditation. Often, these verbs are imperative. They're commanding words such as batter, labour and divorce, which show the speaker begging God to take action. Sometimes, Dunn lists verbs, making them pile up on one another and thus amplifying this sense of energy and action, such as in knock, breathe, shine and seek to mend though we also see it elsewhere in the poem. We also have plosive alliteration, such as in the line break, blow, burn, which is the repetition of these harsh B sounds, which further heightens this sense of violence and ferocity. In the second half of the octave, Dunn introduces a conceit by which he likens himself to a usurped town, which is a town which has been taken over by enemy troops, and the enemy here is sin or the devil. Dunn claims that he's labouring to admit God into the town. He's trying to allow him entrance, but with no success. The verb labour here is also a pun. It has sexual connotations. If you cast your mind back to our analysis of to his mistress going to bed, you'll remember that in that poem, Dunn puns on the same verb when he writes, until I labour, I in labour lie, by which he means that he will not be satisfied until his lover sleeps with him. So here we have the same loaded verb, and its sexual connotations will become relevant in the final part of the poem. Dunn then develops this metaphor of sin as an invader and himself as a city under siege by describing his sense of reason as a viceroy. A viceroy is a ruler who exercises control or authority in a colony on behalf of the sovereign. So Dunn's sense of reason is like a governor, ruling Dunn on behalf of God and Dunn writes that his sense of reason should be defending him from sin. It should be fighting the invaders of the town. However, his reason has proven weak or untrue, and has been taken captive by his sin. So, the really key thing to understand about this midsection of the sonnet is that Dunn likens himself to a city which is under siege by invaders. The invaders of the city are his sins and his secular desires, Dunn's trying to allow God access to the town, but without success. And finally, Dunn's sense of reason is the viceroy of the town. It's an agent of God, working on God's behalf, but it has been captured and imprisoned by the invaders because it's either weak or untrue. After this metaphor, we have a volta and the conceit changes. Instead of a usurped town, Dunn describes himself as a bride, who's engaged to the devil. He's betrothed unto your enemy, betrothed to Satan. Consequently, he begs God to divorce him, to break the knot of matrimony, and to abduct and imprison him. He asks God to ravish him, ending with the paradox, nor ever chaste except you ravish me. He will not be chaste unless God ravishes him. This is paradoxical because, traditionally, to be ravished is to forfeit your chastity. But here Dunn's claiming that the acts of being ravished will enable him to gain his chastity. Sexual intercourse will make him chaste. 
Of course, this sexual intercourse is symbolic and metaphorical. It stands for a kind of spiritual enlightenment and a union with God. But the use of this term, ravish, even in a metaphorical context, would likely have shocked Dunn's contemporaries. This isn't unusual in Dunn's religious poetry. Ilona Bell writes, His religious poems, like his love lyrics, are constantly pushing the limits, enacting resistance, seeking answers, risking outrage. So these are not poems which are traditional, meditative and holy. They were controversial and unusual. Indeed, what makes this poem so paradoxical and controversial are the constant juxtapositions between the sacred and the sinful. Dunn uses metaphors of conquest, both military and sexual, to describe his relationship with God. His request that God divorce him is particularly interesting. Marriage is a holy sacrament, and yet Dunn is requesting that God break this sacred bond. So in other words, he repeatedly uses metaphors of sinful actions, from military invasion to adultery, to describe the act of God reclaiming his soul. Nevertheless, the speaker appears to find comfort in the idea of God saving him through force and violence. The final lines of the sonnet return to iambic pentameter. This is a line of verse made up of ten syllables, alternating between stressed and unstressed beats. This is the traditional metre of Petrarchan sonnets, and of English literature generally. It's steady and controlled. Here, the return to iambic pentameter perhaps suggests that Dunn has found a spiritual resolution and comfort, which is reflected by the controlled metre. We also have a concluding rhyming couplet, Me and Free, which, as we've discussed in relation to other poems, provides a sense of final resolution and reconciliation. So ultimately, this poem highlights Dunn's extremely atypical relationship with God, as well as his characteristic blurring and muddling of seemingly contrary themes, sex and religion, God and sin. Now, rather than analysing another poem, I thought it would be useful to zoom out and analyse this theme across Dunn's work. So as we just discussed, Batter My Heart is a great poem to analyse if you're ever asked to discuss Dunn's relationship with God, because it diverges so significantly from what we expect a religious poem to be. It's active and fast-paced rather than meditative, violent rather than thoughtful, and it uses metaphors of sin to describe the poet's reunion with God. Holy Sonnet 5, I Am A Little World, could be useful for comparison here. We analysed this in the previous video, so do go and watch that if you haven't already. Akin to Batter My Heart, I Am A Little World asks God to use violence to heal and purify the speaker. In addition, you could also compare Holy Sonnet 17, Since She Whom I Loved, to Batter My Heart, because both poems describe God as a lover. They both juxtapose religion and sex by framing the relationship between God and the speaker in terms of sex, courtship and love. The important distinction to be made here, however, is that in Batter My Heart, the speaker invites God into his life as a lover, while Since She Whom I Love resentfully presents God as a jealous lover. Two other poems which are useful in a discussion of the relationship between Dunn and God are A Hymn to God My Father and A Hymn to God My God in My Sickness. I'm happy to analyse these poems in another video if that's what people want, but for now I'll simply say that these poems have much in common. They're both direct addresses to God, and they both dwell on the same themes of salvation, sin, death and the afterlife. Indeed, the context of these poems is purportedly the same. Critics believe that they were written in 1623, when Dunn suffered from a near-fatal illness. As a result, both poems confront the subject of death and question whether God will redeem him for the sins he has committed in his life. This interest in sin and salvation also makes these poems suitable contenders for a comparison with Holy Sonnet 9, If Poisonous Minerals. If Poisonous Minerals, as we discussed previously, dwells on the doctrine of original sin, a chiefly Catholic teaching which claims that all humankind is innately sinful because we have inherited the original sin committed by Adam and Eve. So this discussion of sin and whether Dunn can ever be forgiven for it persists across all three of these poems. Indeed, A Hymn to God My Father actually begins with an allusion to original sin. 
Obviously, these are only six poems, and therefore many, many more poems address the themes of God, religion, sin, etc. So think of this as a mind map of a few initial ideas rather than an exhaustive list. So let's now take a look at a practice essay question. This is what I've come up with. Dunn's religious poetry illustrates a relationship with God which is intensely intimate and affectionate. To what extent do you agree with this view? So the first thing that you should do when you approach an essay question is pick it apart. Analyse the question. A typical feature of a high quality essay is that it will tend to identify and discuss the nuances or grey areas in a question. So let's practice this by doing that now. You'll see that the question refers to all of Dunn's religious poetry, and you should be wary of any question which makes a sweeping generalisation like this. You should be asking yourself, is this really true of all of Dunn's religious poems, or are there any exceptions to this rule? Next, you'll see that the question contains multiple adjectives. According to the quotation, Dunn's relationship with God is both intensely intimate and affectionate. Though these adjectives have similar meanings, they're not the same. A slight distinction can be drawn between them. It's possible to be intensely intimate with someone without necessarily being affectionate. In other words, you don't have to take the adjectives as a package. You can claim that one is more valid than the other. You can take issue with one of the words. You can say, for example, that batter my heart displays an intensely intimate relationship between God and the speaker, but not necessarily an affectionate one and then provide evidence as to why this is the case. Finally, the question is asking you to what extent you agree with the quotation. This is an invitation to agree or disagree partially with the quotation. Your answer doesn't have to be an 100% yes or an 100% no. You can give a more nuanced response. You can show that you recognise that, though this idea is sometimes valid and apt, it's not always the case. There are exceptions to the rule. So a really worthwhile revision task now would be to take this question and write an essay plan which details how you would respond to it. Which poems would you analyse in your answer? What conclusion would you come to? What contextual information could you incorporate into your answer to deepen your analysis? Now that we've analysed quite a few poems, this is a really worthwhile revision task. Anyway, I'm going to conclude here but thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.